Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Elif. Um, I'm from Turkey. Uh, I'm a youth worker, a youth trainer, and uh, currently the president of uh, a youth organization, Turkey Youth Union Association, uh, which uh, has been working in the youth field since 1997 and working directly with uh, young people with disabilities since 2007. Um, we are, as the organization, uh, one of the five uh, NGOs working in this project, Add to Inclusion, uh, for the almost uh, last two years, uh, working to establish an online platform, um, an inclusion platform, inclusion platform that EU. Um, and uh, we have been working together with the other partners from um, Italy, Belgium, Slovenia and Spain uh, to, to map out um, accessible and inclusive youth activities uh, in each of our uh, countries. Uh, and also we have been working on a toolkit uh, in which youth workers who would like to work in mixed ability groups, um, projects or activities could find uh, practical information on how to be more inclusive in designing and implementing uh, youth activities. Uh, there will be a lot of tips and tricks uh, for that uh, purpose. And finally, we have been working on these webinars, just like we're doing today, um, to provide uh, youth workers with and without disabilities uh, on the more uh, deeper information uh, on, the, on some related concepts or uh, sub subjects of inclusion. Uh, in in youth field. So today we will be with Bahar, uh, a very dear friend of mine and uh, and a wonderful colleague that I enjoy a lot to work with for a long time already. Uh, and we will be talking about uh, UNCRPD, which is uh, a convention, a United Nations convention on the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, but before I would like to. Uh, Say hi to Bahar, and uh, yeah, maybe it's good to introduce yourself a bit. Thank you so much. It's a big pleasure for me to uh, be with you today and have an opportunity to share this uh, this um, <clears throat> scene with you. Um, I'm Bahar from Turkey as well. Um, I was one of the founders and um, association working with youth with disabilities and the women uh, youth with disabilities in the field. Uh, and after that, I've, I was, I've been involved in organizations working with women with disabilities and the other um, intersectionality uh, groups, uh, working with intersectionality groups for uh, people with disabilities in Turkey. And also currently I'm um, working as a disabled specialist uh, in a humanitarian aid uh, NGO working in the field of immigration. And also I'm marginally psychologist and I did my master uh, in a trauma and disaster studies mental health program. And hello everyone. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, plus to all of that, uh, she is a youth worker. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and a youth trainer. <laughs> Okay. And she, you are very familiar with uh, youth work and youth project, international youth projects. Um, so we will be also uh, talking about how this uh, convention is important uh, for the youth workers to know about the rights uh, of people with disabilities uh, in particular. Yes, hopefully this is the convention and this is the content that I gave my, I, I took my um youth uh, trainer uh with the supervision of you of course because you were supervising me and i was um delivering this training in turn on, on the subject of uh, UNCRPD 
uh, to the to people who are working directly with persons with disabilities or the NGOs who are willing to work with persons with disabilities and youth with disabilities. And this was another important point. Maybe that's why you chose me for this, yes, for this webinar. Yeah, that, that's why. That, yeah, you're the perfect uh, match uh, <laughs> for this uh, webinar. Yeah, first of all, uh, you had a good deal of experience on that. I know how you are uh, also passionate about this convention like me yes. in some uh, aspects we will be discussing in a while. Uh, we both like this convention and we will be sharing uh, about that. But before uh, starting, I also would like to highlight uh, that Generally, this kind of legal uh, documents, um, like conventions, treaties, uh, declarations, uh, could be a little bit uh, scary and sometimes boring if uh, if you go too much into this like uh, academic part, this, uh, the details about uh, the, the these conventions. It can be uh, not very purposeful to talk about but um for this uh since we like to make everything simplified and easy to understand today uh, it will be a very brief introduction to this convention to the ones who have never heard about it maybe uh, or to the ones who heard about it but doesn't have much information and who has some question marks in their mind so it will be a short uh, 101, maybe, <laughs> introduction <laughs> to, the, to the convention. Uh, for, the, for the rest, for uh, learning more, deeper uh, about this convention, we, uh, from the beginning, suggest, I'm sure you agree, to dig in by yourselves um, by Googling this uh, convention and to learn more. Uh, this will be basically an appetizer uh, about this uh, <laughs> convention, <laughs> we should say. Okay, um, so let's start uh, with uh, very basics, no? So what is UNCRPD? Uh, what do we understand with UNCRPD? Yeah, simply this is a treaty uh, signed by a diff uh, many countries and which is directly for shifting paradigm from seeing people with disabilities at the goodwills of other people or objects of services and help uh, to being a right owner and to the subject of the human of human rights um, and this this is a convention that um that uh, states are signed without any hesitation. And this, is, uh, this convention is uh, addressing the full and effective participation of persons with disabilities in the community on an equal basis of uh, others. Mm -hmm. So we can say that um, there are particular things highlighted, uh, like, as you said, participation yes. and uh, being the subject of an issue uh, which means the rights in this right. case yes. uh, as a person with disabilities to be the subject of this issue not the object anymore perfect yes. so uh, so what is the purpose in general of this uh, uh, it is defined in the treaty as uh, promote protect and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental purposes, the freedoms by all persons with disabilities and promote respect for their inherent dignity. So we can say that uh, it is a new reinforcement for a paradigm, uh, the changing the paradigm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and on also to make the, the state responsible for the rights of persons with disabilities. And this is very important because uh, this is this document is showing the rights based approach to the person with disabilities and the rights of persons with disabilities. And the, um, these are very important things because in the past of course there are some uh, legal documents uh, concerning uh, persons with disabilities but from the definition of the disability 
uh, to the giving responsibilities to countries and also the NGOs and the civil society participation uh, for monitoring and the um, the implementation of the of the convention. This is really important to to emphasize for that. Uh, is an um, and is an is an addition of uh, of the of the definition of the purpose in the industry in the treaty. Exactly. Um, yeah, we will be giving more information about the content of it. But before, since it's a convention and uh, it has to be signed by, <laughs> by people, right, uh, in order to come into force. So um, when we think about it, um, when was it uh, adopted and by whom? Uh, our audience may be curious about it and how many countries have signed or uh, ratified so far. So, in fact, um, it has been uh, a while since this convention was adopted. It's not recently. Um, it was adopted on um, December 2006, but entered into force uh, on May uh, 2008. Um, at that time, uh, there were um, 82 signatories uh, to the convention, which is uh, the actually highest number of signatories in history to a UN convention on its opening day. So we can say that it was very popular <laughs> that day to go and uh, sign this convention. Uh, it's not a bad number, 82. Uh, how about today? Uh, as of today, there are uh, 164 signatories and 186 ratifications. So since I'm mentioning two different concepts of signing, uh, being a signatory and ratification, so let's clarify what are these. So what is being the sig signatory of the convention? So it is the first step basically to become a party to the convention uh, and by signing the convention uh, the states which state it is it's turkey italy belgium which country they indicate their intention to take steps to be bound by the treaty at a later date okay so it's like a it is binding but still there is it is not very definitive um, signing also creates an obligation, but uh, in, in the period between the signing and later ratification, uh, to refrain the state uh, from, the, from the acts that would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty, like not to uh, violate these rights and um, still monitor the implementation. But it is still not very definitive. How about ratification? It is the next step, actually the, the, the most important step, to become a party to the convention uh, and to take a concrete action this time, uh, which signals the intention to undertake legal rights and obligations contained in the convention, simply means like I promise to bring all these obligations, all these rights uh, in my national uh, legislation and my national system and I will be following up, I will be uh, putting them into practice, I will be monitoring it and I will be disseminating it. So it is more like, uh, yes, I do, <laughs> promise. Uh, so this is the difference between the uh, signing and ratification. So far it's not bad. Many countries uh, have signed and ratified the convention, but <laughs> some did it earlier, some did it a bit later. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the ones who run and sign uh, the convention uh, at the earliest possible uh, are doing the best uh, to implement these um convention and the, the articles uh, and it doesn't mean that if they ratified it late and they don't apply these um, articles it it totally depends on the countries on national uh, situation and how they 
perceive human rights and uh, disability rights uh, according to their own understanding, right? Uh, so, for example, my country has uh, signed it like it, it was one of the first signatories, but we still have a lot of uh, things to uh, follow up to implement, to realize uh, the, the articles, the convention. However, on the other hand, there are some countries from Europe who signed and ratified this convention later, but they have been doing maybe a bit better than um, implementation of these rights. Am I right? Yes, of course. <laughs> so, um, okay, but... Um, as you already started to mention about uh, the other already existing um, other conventions about, in general, the human rights uh, conventions or or the other conventions pointing out uh, partially uh, the rights of people with disabilities. So why was it necessary to have another convention on uh, particularly on the rights of persons with disabilities? Because, <laughs> because it was not uh, enough. It was there were there are uh, some existing human rights conventions uh, offering actually considerable uh, potential to promote and protect the rights uh, of persons with disabilities. But it was very obvious that this uh, potential was not being realized. So it was needed to have a better and clear reaffirmation that the rights of persons with disabilities are human rights. And uh, we need to strengthen the respect for these rights. So uh, unfortunately, persons with disabilities uh, continued being denied their human rights and were kept on the margins of the society in all around the world. Well. Still, still, the situation is not uh, completely perfect right now, but this was an instrument to, um, to reaffirm these rights and to take uh, better and more concrete actions, especially on the discontinuing discrimination against uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, and there was a big need to adopt a legally binding instrument uh, which was uh, providing these legal obligations on. So that was the reason why uh, we have uh, a separate uh, convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. Perfect, which it sounds about, great. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. It was very much needed and uh, our actually obligation is to, to follow up to, to ensure that they are being realized. But we uh, talked about a lot about disability and disability. So how a UNCRPD defines disability, Bahar? Um, this is very important because this is the, the yeah. basic term it's covering. Of course, uh, and it is really uh, directly related to what why I was emphasizing the, this paradigm and the change in paradigm in terms of the definition of disability and the framing this concept. Uh, because uh, in this treaty, uh, disability was uh, defined as an evolving concept and as a concept which is really important in an interaction between persons' impairment and the uh, environmental factors. Um, which is uh, these people, people with disabilities, includes those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which interact in interaction with various barriers, may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see that uh, anymore, disability is not a fixed definition. It has a not, no, that has not a fixed definition. It's an evolving concept. It can change um, country to country, time to time, uh, culture to culture. And uh, it's so people are not, people don't need to be, it has need to be in a specific feature. Or this kind of Definition and this treaty includes all kinds of disabilities without 
any exclusion and any discrimination. And also, we can see that a uh, disability isn't a medical problem and a medical def definition. It, this, this is not medical anymore. Mm -hmm. This is an interaction between an impairment and the surrounding environments. That's why this and um, that's why the social factors and environment factors are the are the are in the in the center of of the definition of disability. Mm -hmm. And the, another thing, uh, this convention and this definition is not categorizing uh, people or impairments. This is categorizing better, uh, barriers, uh, environmental factors, designs, attitudes, um, attributions, all other things are related to the environment, so, uh, society, policy, and um, and the physical um, arrangements that play. Uh, that's why uh, this is really important. And this is the first time that we can see disability is uh, an umbrella term, which can which contain different kind of uh, states of mind, state of being for a person with disabilities. And it can uh, involve different kind of situations or people's suffering or I don't know pe people face with it if people face with a different kind of disability uh, difficulties that was not defined as a disability in the in the past can be included anymore in the future um this is this is very hopeful and uh, this is very flexible definition for that kind of concept, which was defined medically or child based in centuries in the past. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's really, really important for me and for people who are working in this field and the countries who signed this convention, of course, because they should change the definition of disability anymore. And um, as we see, most of in most of the countries, disability is a concept which was defined from the medical approach uh, about in, in terms of functionality being functioned or not, capacity, uh, not having something, being lack of something, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why uh, this is time for countries and this is why time for us to change our definition and an understanding of disability from a fix and uh, mm -hmm. one dimensional and um, diagnosed version to evolving inclusive and um, taking account uh, of environmental factors mm -hmm. version. Mm -hmm. So it is prom it's a promising um, document, a legal yes. document, and not only uh, promising to, to be inclusive in terms of uh, people with disabilities and without disabilities, but also it's very inclusive within the group of disabilities. So it's not making a definitive concrete uh, frameworks so, or uh, categorization, but uh, taking the burden from the shoulders of people with disabilities and putting it to the society and the barriers created uh, by the society and uh, not uh, focusing on the disabilities but focusing on the on removing these uh, obstacles uh, with a full uh, understanding of the um, dignity yes we should say Pardon yeah me. Um, there are some guide, uh, guiding principles of this um, convention, right? So yes. there are important underlining, uh, very important aspects of this convention. Yeah, we can see the uniqueness of the convention uh, through those guiding principles, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are eight guiding principles. We can see those principles, uh, the understanding, and the framing of those principles through the the articles of the convention, but to make it concrete and this um, counted, uh, one is that we emphasize 
respect for inherent dignity mm-hmm. and individual autonomy. This is really important because, as you uh, mentioned, um, people with disabilities are subjects of rights and they have dignity and also they have a potentiality and uh, they have a right to make decisions. Uh, and with this uh, first guiding principles, we can see that uh, it's really important to um, respect for inherent dignity of persons with disabilities and open a space uh, to support them to have uh, to to make choices and define their their life or uh, what they want how, how where they want to live how they want to organize things about their lives um, so this is really important in terms of um, autonomy that is um, yeah. that is that is for everyone not just uh, you know adults. Or not just people without disabilities, also people with disabilities and all old, uh, old people in, in, in age. Um, so the second one is non-discrimination. Uh, and this is very important because in the world we, we see that there are lots of discriminations against key uh, groups that are being discriminated from the society because of their gender, because of their identity, their political view, their physical or sensory differences. Um, and this convention uh, defines the discrimination in different ways. Mm-hmm. One is direct discrimination that can be observed, um, observable. You know, this is really obvious when you are looking for something, which is uh, whether it is in discrimination or not. If somebody say that, oh, since you are elif, <laughs> you cannot participate in this uh, activity. It's an open discrimination. And you can say that, okay, I'm discriminated uh, from, from participating um, uh, to, to this activity or from being a member of another or any any organization or being employed by an uh you know by an institution mm-hmm. but um another version which is defined in the in the convention is indirect discrimination which is um which can be observed if you you know um if you see that lots of things are designed and they say that okay it is open for everyone everyone can enjoy and can come can be part of our community but uh, you see some barriers that are um making making hard to to participate for for some people this is an indirect discrimination um for example, you organize a huge project uh, and you say that, yeah, everybody can apply, yeah. we're open for every uh, application, but then uh, you don't uh, organize a sign language interpreter uh, for maybe a deaf participant, but you are open uh, to <laughs> to everyone. So you are creating and you actually deny uh, and you reject organizing um, this uh, conditionally or unconditionally, so that is an indirect discrimination, right? Yes, of course. Uh, the design of the this an activity, the place that you choose for participation, if it is not accessible for people with disability with disabilities, and the content, uh, even you know, even the news or even the very little things that you can. S- you can see n- not important uh, or c- c- can be the reason why you do or you are uh, subject to the you know indirect discrimination. Mm-hmm. And also there is another concept which is very important uh, when we are talking about indirect discrimination, which is um, reasonable accommodation. Uh, oh, I need to define this you know in a simple way. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a con uh, concept which is very important because um, when we go through the convention, we see the um, universal design. As we can guess, this is an um, design universally imagine universally uh, in which the people with people with difference and you know everyone let's say can access without any any barrier if we produce something some some digital things some environment some training some activity if everyone can participate without any kind of um hardness or anyone can't you know fight with any difficulty which is a we can say that this is a universal design uh but in the uh in reality there are not lots of places uh, lots of activities lots of contents which are you know universal designed that's why um reasonable accommodation is an accommodation that we do for persons uh who can ac uh, access and enjoy their rights and participate in the community in the workplace uh in the in the educational education social activities sports cultural activities everything uh these are reasonable accommodations so these accommodations are made uh, without being a burden uh for the um let's say the person or the institution who are doing this uh, this these accommodations um so that can be understood broadly or uh, uh very limited because you know mm -hmm. uh, some people can say that this is out of my you know power or it's really hard but this is not the thing um states institutions um should do some precautions and some preparations for providing reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why uh, without, if we don't do reasonable accommodation, it can be another type of discrimination against persons with disabilities. That's why this is a really, really important concept. I'm, I'm not sure whether I can define, but no, no, if I you don't... have something to add. No, no, it's perfectly uh, clear. But I can give maybe another example for that. Yeah, please. Uh, if uh, a student wants to register uh, a student with a disability, let's say uh, a wheelchair user student, uh, want to register uh, a school or, or uh, let's say a course, um, it's a public course. Um, but the classes, let's say, um, of that particular person uh, will be, uh, they're upstairs. And the building is uh, an old building and it is not possible to, to make an elevator, right? So um, a reasonable accommodation says that for a period, not forever, <laughs> you can uh, organize temporarily uh, the class changing the classes uh, downstairs uh, so that the student can uh, as you said by uh, himself herself uh, without uh, some other people are uh, need to carry that person um, join the classes just like everybody else but this should be as i said temporary, this reasonable accommodation uh, provides some time if it is not possible to make it accessible or inclusive uh, in a minute. So it gives uh, the institutions, the state, some time to organize it uh, according to the universal design understanding. So in a short time, they need to, this building should be revised and uh, organized if they cannot put an elevator they can put you know this um more mobile uh, elevators not uh, the concrete ones uh they can use that one so so that everything is uh, ordinary for and the same and equal for everyone so it provides some uh short time some practical let's say some practical uh adaptation uh but should be uh in time turn into 
uh, a universal design and universal understanding of accessibility. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the committee in the general co um, commands on the articles, they have eight general commands on different articles. Um, the committee say that also, you know, these terms or these um, preparations cannot be used interchangeably. If you say, okay, this is a reasonable recommendation, so I don't need to do something for, for uh, making it accessible. It's not true, you know. You can do accessible, uh, you can do something for ex making it accessible. Um, uh, you can, you know, complete the checklist for an accessibility if you have, if or if you get, uh, get from an NGO, from different standards. From us, actually, with this project, we will be providing this checklist, uh, at least for the youth projects. Yeah, but yeah. as you see, even though some, an organization complete all this checklist. Mm -hmm. if anyone can come and say, I have, I need this for, for participation. So yeah. you need to do extra things mm -hmm. uh, different than your checklist. Mm -hmm. This is a reasonable accommodation. So um, everyone has some uh, the different needs and different um, problems to access something. For example, in workplaces, let's say, uh, you can you can need some um, some device or some arrangement in your work hours, but it should be a certain uh, set of work hours. But uh, for you, there should be a reasonable accommodation, and then in that way, you can uh, work um, with, with showing your showing with showing your potentiality. Let's say um, so. That's why. These are very important, and we should be we should be in, pay, in the same page, and we, we should clarify our minds because these concepts are not uh, these concepts are not uh, cannot be used interchangeably, or mm -hmm. uh, you cannot uh, you cannot um, <laughs> how can I say uh, we cannot say sorry I did this and I don't need to do this. Mm -hmm. do another thing so we need to do all things uh, all those things at the same time or if a new person comes and says new thing that's why uh, this definition of disability is evolving concept and so the needs and expectations are uh, different can be different and sh can can change over time to time place to place activity to activity mm -hmm. um so uh, accessibility was another concept, as we mentioned, um, for, for, for guiding principles, for being a guiding principles. Um, and also the other one, mm -hmm. full and inclusion, uh, full participation and inclusion in society. Uh, this is the thing that we all emphasize through this, uh, this webinar. Because um, uh, for making subjects, uh, for making disabled people subjects of the uh, of the convention of the of, of rights, this is really important for participation to the community, for participation to the implementation of the con convention, for, for start for participation of a different kind of um, stages, phases of uh, of life. Uh, that's why this is really important in guiding principle, and also this is um, directly connected to um, the rights of independent living that we will be talking about, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is another guiding principles. As I said, these concepts are can be found in in the different articles of the convention, mm -hmm. um, and also as we say. Uh, we don't uh, say word to word, but we um, it, we cover the content of the fourth um, guiding principles, mm -hmm. which is respect for difference and acceptance of persons with disabilities uh, as part of human diversity and humanity. So diversity is very important. We are always emphasizing the importance of diversity in our activities. 
to make it more inclusive, uh, not to leave anyone behind. Uh, that's why uh, for persons with disabilities, uh, persons with disabilities are um, one of the one of one of an, an important part for for diversity uh, of of humanity uh, with the with uh, some uh, possessions with some I don't know uh, some features they have mm -hmm. some difference uh, in terms of intellectual uh, differences uh, physical differences uh, sensory differences um, and. It is a stereotype actually sometimes, but uh, I don't want to make it an a stereotype typical, uh, make it stereotypical in a way. But uh, you know, we see that the contribution of disabled people in the in the in the society through through centuries in terms of science, uh, literature, uh, and the because the perspective can change and people's contribution to the community and to to world. Human, humanity can change. It is not. I'm. I don't. I. I'm not trying to say these are people with disabilities are superhuman, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but the differences of understanding, the uh, differences of physical, sensory, sensory, and intellectual um, uh, belongings uh, can benefit. Uh, can can be beneficial for all because of the perspective. The, change, the difference in, per, in the perspective and the contribution and the potentiality of the pe of the people with disabilities, thanks to the diversity. Uh, I hope uh, it's it would you know be um, clear. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely, it was yeah. clear. These actually these guiding principles are very important, yes. and um, e even just checking these guiding principles, you have a. a very clear understanding of um, the mentality of the convention. Uh, to tell the truth, everything I, I really like are within these the guiding principles, including participation. And uh, you mentioned about this participation, it's very important, like the meaningful active participation, it's, uh, it is underlining. It is not just uh, being um, uh, like um, the audience or or the uh, quantity <laughs> service receiving. No, it's just being there in all the all the dimensions aspects. There is one um, uh, quote I could share in that uh, sense of participation. The importance of this participation. It's like um, it says if you if there is something going on about you about your issues, your uh, problems. And there is a table there, no? It's like, uh, and you are not, if you are not on the table, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> most probably, and it's a big danger that you're in the menu. So yeah. you have to have That's a okay. thing. Uh, you have to have uh, your voice there by yourself, uh, not represented by others, but by yourself actually there. Otherwise there are really big uh, dangers in that underrepresentation, non-representation of uh, people with disabilities. So this convention is, that's why very valuable that it's providing uh, because it was prepared, it was drafted uh, together with uh, people with disabilities. Yeah. I also like it a lot, but on the other hand, it's not just the guiding, guiding principles, but there are uh, the, uh, the core uh, rights, the human rights, as we mentioned, which are no different than uh, the, the, uh, the other human rights, the universal human rights. So they, they are also mentioned in the convention. And I would like to share maybe uh, some of them uh, to, to make it clear uh, better. Before uh, then, I, I have just two uh, Last uh, guiding principles to oh, finalize yeah. the guiding principles, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and to help you to uh, build uh, upon those 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 five principles um, to this uh, yeah, very important night because uh, one was very important because the equality between men and women, you know, gender issue is very important in different uh, treaties. We can see that. 
and also for, for persons with disabilities and for women and men with disabilities and women and men without disabilities. This equality issue is another important thing. And also this convention is also emphasizing the importance of giving uh, respect uh, for the evolving capacities of children with disabilities and for their rights and also um, giving a very big importance to the best interest of children with disabilities uh, and supporting them to raise their voices and uh, to to express their wishes. Uh, that, that's why it is very important and we will be also talking about uh, those uh, particular groups. <laughs> Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that I was planning to actually ask you separately. So yes. uh, thank you for yes making it more clear now. These two groups, as you mentioned, women with disabilities and children with disabilities are identified separately. So can you please more elaborate why they uh, require to put them uh, separately in the in the convention put more focus on on these two groups yeah because um these two groups are intersectional groups like being disabled and being woman being disabled and being child um can be uh th these groups can be discriminated from the society multiple in multiple times um that's why uh, this is really important to emphasize this two, these two groups because um, being a woman is different than being a disabled woman and being a child is different from being a disabled child and the multiplication and the, the discrimination and the barriers barriers that those, those groups can face with can be layered uh, and um, it is really important to emphasize the needs and uh, challenges of those those uh, those particular groups for kids uh, for children with disabilities. For example, the inclusive education is really important. But in terms of uh, women with disabilities, it's really important the empowerment of women with disabilities when doing uh, some um, when uh, let's say. Uh, when, when including those 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 groups in terms of um, the equality issue, for example, but disability brings different things and different realities in terms of equality between men and women. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, if children with disabilities cannot access education or good health and care, um, this is different. Uh, this is different and multiplied. Uh, compared to the other groups, other children, children who are who, who have some limitation to access education, good health, and care. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why uh, uh, when this convention was prepared, being prepared, um, they gave very big importance to emphasize these two groups mm -hmm. uh, and uh, put them in the front uh, to uh to to make visible their rights and the possible uh the barriers as we say the categorization of barriers can be um faced by women and children with disabilities mm -hmm. exactly thank you very much um I, as i um, said a couple of minutes ago uh, a, and we have been mentioning from the beginning um, convention is not creating like new, super new rights uh, for us. <laughs> it defines um, with a better clarity uh, of the implementation of the existing rights, this universal rights, human rights, to the specific situation uh, of the persons with disabilities. Um, but Again, just to mention uh, the, the human rights, what are the human rights uh, in the convention? Just to briefly give uh, some of the examples. Uh, right to life, of course. Uh, right to liberty and security of the person. E equality before the law without discrimination. 
uh, freedom from torture, equal recognition before the law and legal capacity, freedom from exploitation, violence, and abuse, right to respect physical and mental integrity, freedom of movement and nationality, right to live in the community, freedom of expression, uh, respect for privacy, respect for home and family, right to education, obviously, right to health, right to work, right to have an adequate standard of living, right to participate in political and public life, right to participate in cultural life. So these are a already uh, mentioned in the existing uh, other instruments, other conventions, but of course they are also the core of uh, this uh, convention as well. But uh, in this convention, differently, some appropriate measures to ensure some of these rights uh, have been mentioned. For example, for the freedom of expression and opinion and access to information, uh, in the convention, it uh, says that we need to provide information in accessible formats and technologies proper to the different kinds of disabilities in a timely manner and without additional cost. And uh, we need to accept and facilitate as the signatories, the use of sign languages, braille, augmentative and alternative communication, and all other accessible means of communication in, in the official interaction. And in terms of uh, what we mentioned about a decade standard of living and social protection, uh, we need to provide um, access to appropriate and affordable services and devices and uh, other kind of assistances for disability related needs. Um, just like you have been saying, it's like um, specifying uh, these rights, like a little bit opening up and pointing the actual needs, uh, requirements of uh, any adaptations of mm -hmm. Persons with disabilities, it is mentioned in this document. Otherwise, it's again a human rights convention, uh, nothing different in terms of the uh, understanding of the human rights approach. Um, so maybe we can uh, just give a bit uh, interesting uh, facts about this uh, convention. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, of course. As you said in the beginning, mm -hmm. this is the fastest negotiated and signed uh, convention, prepared convention. The negotiations last just four years. Yeah. It's really fast. It's fast. Super, no, super fast. They will think that four years, is it fast? Yes, it is really fast. Foreign convention, it's really fast because, you know, everyone is just, you know, discussing very important and very little details as words, you know. I don't want this word here. It's not okay for me. So for this convention, it's really super fast. Yeah. And uh, in the beginning, when the, it's opened for the signatures, just 82, you know, 82 countries said, okay, this is time for me to, you know, design the, the convention. One of us, uh, one of those uh, countries was uh, Turkey, uh, our, our country. And, um, and it was the first time in the history as mm -hmm. well. Uh, the civil society and the people with disabilities actively participated in the developments and negotiations of the text of this convention. This mm -hmm. is really important. And uh, as we say, uh, this convention marks a paradigm shift yeah. in attitudes and approaches to persons with disabilities. From the definition to the, the, the covering the rights and needs of persons with disabilities. And also, this is very another important thing, and you like this feature of, of the convention, which is uh, this convention is the first international document study ever that recognizes sign language yeah. as a linguistic right of deaf people. Exactly. So this is the first time. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, <laughs> being the two fans of this convention, yes, this is uh, what I really like about this convention, um, about uh, recognizing sign languages, not only the sign language, but also the Braille and the other uh, the instruments uh, required uh, by persons with disabilities. Uh, yes, that's why I want to ask you that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Ask me. What do you like the most uh, specifically from this convention? Yes, I like this one. Uh, <laughs> uh, sign language being recognized uh, a lot because uh, I can see, uh, I observed after this convention was in, uh, in force, uh, the countries, the signatories started to also uh, recognize their own national sign languages uh, yeah. rapidly right after this convention. So that was a very uh, good step. That means recognizing uh, is not just recognizing. You build up the system of sign language. You produce materials, educational materials. You start to have uh, sign language interpretations on TV or on the other uh, broadcasting media, or whatever. So uh, this is a great uh, step. Uh, for for the deaf uh, community uh, all around the world, so that's one thing. And the other thing uh, I would say, uh, there's nothing about us without us. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I really like. Um, we all already mentioned about it, so I will not uh, repeat again. But putting uh, the the persons with disabilities into the center uh, as a subject. And as a decision making about this uh, convention and what it is implying, as I think a big, big, big time uh, um, step for the humanity and for the disability rights movement. What about you? What do you like the most about? Uh, I like uh, the convention how it puts the social inclusion and independent living rights, right like independently living uh, for persons with disabilities, because you know. Uh, independent living is a concept uh, which is at the heart of this convention, I think. Uh, without independent living, we cannot hear the voice of persons with disabilities. And also this, this article and also general comment on the article 19 defines uh, what kind of mechanisms are important for, it in, uh, for independent living. For example, the institutionalization. I said it okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. And <laughs> because you know, we, as we see for centuries, people with disabilities um, were uh, forced to leave the institutions, mm -hmm. and that's why this is really important that we we can see people with disabilities participating in the community and living uh, in the suitable houses in the community with adequate financial aids and financial support in the personal assistance, which can be found. And there are lots of um, resources about personal assistance. And this is a really important concept. And also the, um, the equal uh, recognition before the law yeah. and the legal capacity, because, uh, you know, we say that everyone has some rights and everyone has rights, fundamental rights, civil rights, social rights. Um, but at the same time, these people, the people who is the right owner also has a, has a has legal, legal capacity to act, to be an, a to be at a party of an, uh, any in document, document or can be um, can be active in the legal legal procedures, and also uh, can do some official um, uh, official uh, uh, conduction, uh, <laughs> and that's why uh, the legal capacity is for everyone, not just uh, people with disabilities without disabilities. Legal capacity is a right for people with intellectual disabilities, mental. Um, intellectually and sensory disabilities for psycho uh, people with psychosocial disabilities, different kind of disabilities. It's not about the uh, it, it's it's not limit putting limits uh, in front of people with disabilities to be uh, to be um, 
uh, to, to have in legal capacity, everyone can has uh, everyone can uh, <laughs> everyone have uh, the legal capacity, but some people need some um, some support uh, when acting. Uh, yeah. while acting, while um, signing some documents, let's say, or uh, conduct, conducting some processes, some official processes. Of course, this article is also addressing the, the, the these needs and the what and the country what the country should do um, for helping or supporting persons with disabilities to access any legal capacity, um, but also um, it is it it's required to very important to shift the paradigm for judges and the legal authorities uh, for persons with disabilities to enjoy uh, to the legal to the uh, equal recognition before the law with other people. Mm -hmm. I know you had a very um, how many years it was uh, one. One and a half or two years of projects you have implemented specifically on this uh, article of uh, independent living. Right? Yes, yeah, so fifteen months project uh, for the promotion of the, the right of independent living in the Turkey and the person assistant as a tool, tool is a key tool for independent living and social inclusion. Uh, it was a, another EU supported project uh, financed by EU and it was uh, it also produced uh, great outputs in terms of only one article of uh, out of 50 articles of this convention. So that article and what it uh, points out is very significant. Yeah. Okay. Um, to conclude though, Maybe we should also mention about uh, the obligations. Okay, we have a good written, well-written, uh, collectively written document, and it's uh, it's very um, fruitful and it has a big potential. But if we don't implement all the other written documents, it will be the same. It will we will not uh, proceed. So uh, what? Who, first of all, who is responsible of uh, this? to put this convention into practice. And uh, actually, what are the general obligations we have? First, uh, the responsibles are, of course, the countries, not the states, the, the states who uh, put their signature, the ones who ran in the first day, <laughs> and ratified uh, or after they had their time a little bit, think about it, work on it and sign it after. But the main responsibility is, of course, on behalf of the people, the states. But that doesn't mean that, OK, my state signed it and so they will do everything. No, we as the individuals, we also have uh, these uh, responsibilities uh, and also the NGOs. Oh, now we're here, we are also representing uh, our own NGOs. So as NGOs who are specifically advocating for the uh, disability rights or not necessarily, we are a youth organization. We work with mixed ability groups. We work with young people with disabilities. We are also responsible to, uh, first of all, um, enhanced awareness raising uh, to make other people, more people to know about this convention, its requirement, its content, and its obligations. Uh, about accessibility, we need to be uh, more accessible in all aspects of our lives, in our activities, in our uh, building up our organizational uh, mechanisms, uh, reaching out to young people with disabilities, all people with disabilities. Um, again, considering the situations of risk and humanitarian emergencies, which currently Turkey is uh, under a big uh, and very serious one right now after the earthquake. So uh, we have to take care of all the uh, emergency uh, precautions beforehand and during this um, disaster or risk or uh, the other humanitarian uh, issues. Mm -hmm. um, ensuring the access to justice 
ensuring the personal mobility, uh, providing opportunities uh, for the proper habilitation and rehabilitation, um, and never forgetting about the data and the statistics, which are very important because yes. lead us lack. <laughs> yes, which we lack a lot to reach um, up-to-date uh, statistics and the data and uh, international cooperation as well. So we need to, we as individuals, as organizations, as the uh, states, the countries, signatories, we have to, we are all responsible. We are all on this. So people with disabilities and people without disabilities. So we share these responsibilities and uh, we can do whatever we can um, in our share and in order to implement and bloom this um, convention because it has uh, amazing potential. Would you like to add anything? Um. I think this uh, convention, when you read this convention, it brings very, it brings hope to you in your heart because uh, this convention is very, uh, you know, hopeful, a very, you know, uh, inclusive, um, uh, very future opening <laughs> uh, convention and document. That's why. Um, there are lots of things to discuss. Sometimes this convention can be found uh, very, you know, like uh, supernatural, uh, and it is not uh, touching the reality of the of the world because this is really uh, this is showing the optimistic uh, optimistic conditions that should be uh, provided uh, to to full and in full participation and enjoyment of the rights. Uh, Knowing the reality in the world, uh, putting the uh, needs and the requirements for uh, people with disabilities and also addressing uh, secretly and in, 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 in a secret way and uh, not showing openly for all people, um, for um, the full participation and the, the benefic um, benefits for everyone. That's why um, these documents and this treaty is a hope for all, for us, uh, in, in, for, for us living in the, in, the, in the world on Earth. Uh, thanks for all contributors uh, to this uh, uh, documents, the, the treaty, I just want to say. And thank you for giving me this opportunity today to share and talk talk to you about this really important convention. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, it was always a joy to to share these things with you. And um, yes, uh, I would like to mention one more thing. Okay, I will. I will just once more uh, share uh, our uh, inclusion platform. That EU. If you have further questions or other ideas about uh, UNCRPD or the rights of people with disabilities, please uh, reach us through there. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Angel, for the organization. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.